Sorry about that. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for bringing us through this week. For all the blessings, Father, that you bestowed upon us. For your grace and your mercy. And as we, Father, some of us have entered into the Sabbath and some of us are yet to still enter into the Sabbath. We just thank you for getting us here and ask you, Father, to pour us out a blessing, a double portion of your spirit. As we continue, Father, to go through the, the book, The Evangelicals, we ask you for the presence of your Holy Spirit to help us to understand, Father, as we read, as we continue to study the history, Father, of, in the time frame of Billy Graham. We ask your blessing upon your movement, Father. We ask a blessing upon our leaders that they would ever be strengthened, filled with courage and humility and faith, Father, and um, given them that they might be strengthened for the great responsibility that they, that's been given to them. We pray for a blessing upon all the elders, Father, in their respective locations, and ask you, Father, to help us as a movement to be organized for service, prepared for family. <laughs> To glorify thee in all that we do and say. <laughs> Thank you, and we pray you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. <laughs> okay. Let me pull the share screen out. Hey, Christine. Uh, yeah. Are you up to doing share screen for me? And if not, it's okay. I have it ready. Um, I can't. Uh, if Francisco will go get me a glass of water. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. It's okay. Is that, he's, he's going. He's, I, I was, um, I can do it. You can do it? Yeah. Okay. And Kathy said that they're jumping off. Well, Kathy, we're glad you are here, and we praise God that your surgery went well. Um, and continued prayers for you, because I know you have another surgery coming up. So if you get to stay with us, great. And if not, happy Sabbath to you guys. Thanks, babe. And I will tell you, we're on page 142. Okay, I'm almost there. 142. Come on, work with me. All right, it's been weird. Sorry. Okay. Okay. What did I say? One what? One forty-two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, you scroll down just a teeny bit for a second. I want to make sure that's more. Yeah. Let me get to my um. Because I think that. Sister Elaine, there's an is an echo with when you talk. When I talk? Yeah, it's not as clear as Christine's voice is. Hmm. It's like it's got a slow drag to it when you say something. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Everybody else having a problem hearing me too? I can hear you. It's just different. It's not a clear tone like it usually is. Hmm. Glad you're clear here in this end. Okay. The Protestants who swarmed. Okay. The Protestants, that's where I want to pick up. So scroll up just a teeny bit. And if maybe somebody else wants to read, um, or I'll start. Um, whoops. Yeah, hold on. Oh, I want this one instead because why is my thing not doing that? From right here? 
Yeah, that's where I wanted to start because we were actually down a couple paragraphs, but I was listening to this chapter again um, before we got started. Okay. For a while, then I just I was picking up some things that I I know I missed, but the, um, because we know that the between the modernist fundamentalist fundamentalist movement the the fundamentalist basically lost and the the um, modernist came out the victor there but then the modern or the fundamentalist then actually had two divisions within and that's where i think i was getting confused last time so so the protestants who swarmed into the churches and the revival tents in this period included a great many fundamentalists and other evangelical conservatives that fact was not well understood at the time. The outcome of the fundamentalist modernist controversy had, after all, been interpreted as a victory for modernism. And since then, the liberals in control of the seminaries had taken the leadership roles in the major northern denominations. And some had become a part of the intellectual establishment. So they taken leadership roles in major northern denominations, some had become a part of the intellectual establishment. In the 1950s, the theologians Reinhold Niebuhr, Niebuhr and Paul Tillich riveted the attention of liberal American intellectuals generally. Forgotten was the fact that in the fundamentalist modernist conflict, the liberals had narrowly won their right to exist in the Northern Baptist and Presbyterian denominations. The fundamentalists had lost, but the winners had been the inclusivist conservatives. And that's the, that was where that part of that difference was. The winners had been the inclusivist conservatives and they represented those many in the pews who paid no attention to the doctrinal disputes of their leadership. Then too, conservatives continued <clears throat> to dominate the South and to make up a significant percentage of other large Northern denominations, such as the Disciples of Christ. A number of the smaller denominations were entirely conservative. These included the Holiness and Pentecostal churches, much influenced by fundamentalism and some Anabaptist groups, such as the Mennonites, they also included denominations established by mid to late 19th century immigrants from rural Northern Europe. Among them, the Christian Reformed Church from the Netherlands, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod from Germany, and the Swedish Baptists. These had taken on fundamentalist characteristics as their congregants became English speaking and integrated themselves into American society. These various conservative groups had been a part of the landscape for many years, but uncontroversial and separated from each other by region and denominational boundary. They were hidden in plain sight. So it's interesting because there's, like within Adventism, you have the, the conservative and the liberal um, side. But as we saw, it was a Wednesday night that the, the church itself, the institution is a conservative church but it does have the liberal um, faction in it. So these denominations all individually have their um, liberal conservative in it in, in each, in, within each denomination. So the fundamentalists are made up of, of multiple denominations. It says these various conservative groups had been a part of the landscape for many years, but uncontroversial and separated from each other by region and denominational boundaries. They were hidden in plain sight. What was more, the militant fundamentalists never fit the role the liberals had assigned to them or accepted their designated fate. They had lost the battle for prestige, but they did not lose their sizable constituencies And as before, fundamentalism flourished with new groups springing up, as one historian put it, like Dandelion. Their leaders, contentious and authoritarian, 
never created a national organization that reflected fundamentalist numbers. Okay, so their leaders, contentious and authoritarian, never created a national organization that reflected fundamentalist numbers. Still many of them, such as Reuben Torrey, James M. Gray, William B. Riley, and J. Frank Norris, were spiritual entrepreneurs who, during the 1930s and 40s, built networks of local churches and an array of institutions to train young preachers and to propagate the faith in the religious drought experienced by mainline denominations, their flocks increased, as did those of many conservative groups like the Southern Baptist Convention. On the whole, cultural exile suited the fundamentalist leaders. Indeed, some stepped deliberately into outer roles portraying themselves as martyrs and the faithful as a beleaguered remnant fighting the devil incarnate in all the forces of the secular and apostate world. This stance inspired conspiracy theories of the vilest sort, but it also fostered group solidarity and attracted Bible-believing Protestants alienated in the strange new world of global depression and global war. From their wanderings in the wilderness, the fundamentalists emerged stronger than before. I thought it was interesting that they say that from their wanderings in the wilderness. During the 1950s, fundamentalists divided into two camps. Here it goes, okay. So the fundamentalists in the 50s divided into two camps corresponding to the two conflicting impulses present in fundamentalism since its inception. And here's the two um, conflicting impulses. One to guard doctrinal purity without compromise. The other to reclaim America and to gain the world for Christ through revivals. So there's two conflicting impulses within fundamentalism in the 50s. One to guard, and it had been there since its inception, one to guard doctrinal purity without compromise, the other to reclaim America and to gain the world for Christ through revivals. Virtually all fundamentalists believed in both courses of action. But in the 1940s, many felt they had to make choices and the two impulses materialized in the form of two parties, one separatist, militant, and often politically extremist, the other inclusivist, bent on regaining respectability and culture influence, preferring to be called evangelical as opposed to fundamentalist. What would we look at that as today? So there's two parties in the fundamentalist group, one separatist militant and often politically extremist, and the other inclusivist bent on regaining respectability and culture influence, preferring to be called evangelical as opposed to fundamentalist. What are your guys' thoughts on that division there? There's a lot of ways you can, I've been, you know, I, I don't know, I can come up um, with a clear, clear answer for you, because it makes me think of a lot of different things. Um, the evangelical, them being, pre, be, uh, preferring to be called evangelical reminds me of what we've learned of Billy Graham, because I think he's the one that, I think we read that, that he's the one that chose that word um, instead of the fundamentalist uh, word, do, do you re recall that? That it was him that changed yeah. that terminology? Yeah. So yeah. I was thinking about that and how it plays into what we just read here. And then, of course, I was thinking about Pharisees and Sadducees. I know, it's, um, but I'm just sharing with you what I was thinking because uh, Jesus liked to spend time with the Sadducees. They were more comfortable for him 
apparently to spend time with. So they must have been less extreme um, in many ways, right? And um, then I also was wondering how this plays out in the Republican Party, yeah, uh, right? Is that was that's what you're thinking? So there's a lot of things that compiling through my mind. So that's, maybe some yeah, other people have some input. Yeah. Anybody else any thoughts on it? That was where my my mind was going to is with the at least within the Republican Party. So there's one separatist, militant, and often politically extremist, and that would seem like it's the far right. And the other inclusivist, bent on regaining respectability and cultural influence, preferring to be called evangelicals. And then that would be like the religious standpoint though of it. So the two different types, yeah, the two different types that are within that party, but it seems that they're going to have to somehow marry those, marry those um, ideologies somehow uh, to strengthen their, um, either that or sift out all the inclusivist ones, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So the two parties were, however, not completely distinct, for both came out of the crucible of the fundamentalist modernist controversy. Indeed, to trace the intellectual lineage of the leaders of both parties in the 1950s, and well after that, is to discover, as it were, a family tree linking them, personally or institutionally, with men like Corey, Riley, Norris, and Machen, Machen. How the fundamentalists survived and extended their reach during the Great Depression in World War II was ignored by religious historians at the time. Liberal churchmen, certain that liberal theology or secularization was Um, the trend of the 20th century were in denial. Only in the 1980s, when such trained evangelical historians as George Marsden and Joel Carpenter came on the scene, was the subject explored by the account of, of Carpenter and younger evangelical scholars, a large but unknown number of fundamentalists left the major denominations in the 1930s to join or found independent local Bible churches, or they left liberal denominations for more conservative ones. More, however, remained in the mainline denominations, sheltered within conservative churches, and in some cases, regional bodies like presbyteries and state conventions. Both groups, however, gave increasing support to the building of a network of trans-denominational agencies, some of which had been founded many years earlier. So you kind of wonder, if, I mean, I wonder if they were, so they're building a network of trans-denominational, that means they work through the multiple denominations, right? I think trans means across the board. Yeah, yeah, right? I, I explained it right, but that's what I'm thinking that means too. So they're so they're kind of, then that's what ecumenicalism is, right? When they join together, did I get that right? Yeah. Um, so both groups, however, gave increasing support to the building of a network of trans-denominational agencies, some of which had been founded many years earlier. So they're working together. Yeah, they're trying to enlist. It, it, it sounds like they're trying to incorporate those so they can build a big, you know, a larger body of people that are working together. So of these agencies, the most important were the Bible Institutes. And in the 30s and 40s, their number grew 
at an impressive rate. According to Carpenter, there were 50 of them in 1930 and 144 in 1950. Some were no more than evening classes held in a local church, but others developed into comprehensive centers of religious activity, training pastors as well as laymen and exercising many of the functions of a denomination. By the early 30s, these included the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, Gordon College of Theology and Missions in Boston, the Philadelphia School of the Bible, the National Bible Institute in New York City, and Northwestern Bible and Missionary Training School in Minneapolis. The largest of them and the pace setter for the rest, the Moody Bible Institute, drew students, largest of them and the pace setter for the rest, the Moody Bible Institute, drew students from all over the country, put on conferences in hundreds of churches a year and published a magazine that by 1940 had 40,000 subscribers. Fundamentalists also founded seminaries and liberal arts colleges, though few with any academic standing. The Baptist seminaries, for the most part, offered only pastoral training for students without a college degree. The handful of seminaries that served Presbyterians had post baccalaureate programs, but the most influential was the Dallas Theological Seminary, founded by a colleague of C.I. Schofield, which specialized in the teaching of dispensationalism. As for the colleges, most of them developed out of the Bible schools and all emphasized training for mission work in church activities. Bob Jones University, named for Alabama evangelists who founded it in 1927, became well known among Northern and Southern fundamentalists, but it had no accreditation of any kind. By far the most prestigious was Wheaton College in Illinois. Established by Methodists before the Civil War, Wheaton, unlike most of its peers, had retained its conservative evangelical character and under the presidency of fundamentalist J. Oliver Buswell Jr. It became academically respectable and the largest liberal arts college in the state with over a thousand students. Fundamentalists were scattered all over the country but summer Bible conferences brought huge numbers of people together each year and enthusiasm for missions fostered cooperation among far-flung con congregations. At a time when the mainline denominations were retrenching on overseas evangelism, fundamentalist Bible schools and colleges turned out hundreds of missionaries a year. During the mid-1930s, fundamentalists contributed one out of every seven North American Protestant missionaries. And by the early 1950s, the proportion had doubled. Fundamentalist publications increased in numbers and circulation. And when commercial radio became available, fundamentalist evangelists took to it as to a revival tent with unlimited space. They bought airtime on local stations or networks and paid for it through appeals to their audiences something mainline ministers were loath to do. Fundamentalist centers such as Moody, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, and John Roach Stratton's New York Church developed Bible study and children's programs, and a number of preachers attracted regional followings on the air. Would somebody else like to read? I can read. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, fundamentalism was also spread by charismatic preachers who built their religious empires in various regions of the country. In a world with few established institutions, they created their own and pioneering the way for others, they made personal and family empires a permanent feature of the fundamentalist world. 
William B. Riley was one of the most successful of these preachers. And in his book, God's Empire, the historian William Trollinger describes how Riley made his Bible school an agency for the fundamentalist colonization of the upper Midwest. Not long after taking over the First Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Riley discovered that the rural churches in the upper Midwest, Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, Wisconsin, and the Dakotas were chronologically understaffed, chronically, were chronically understaffed, and some had had to close down for lack of a pastor. Inspired by the Moody School, he founded a non-denominational institute, the Northwestern Bible and Missionary Training School, to train ministers and lay workers to bring these churches back to life. His school began modestly in 1902 with seven students in a church classroom. But Riley, mm -hmm. who excelled at fundraising and administration, gradually built it up. By 1917, the school had 81 students and afterward, as halls and dormitories were constructed, the enrollment mounted, reaching 388 by 1935. With many more students attending evening classes. By then, Riley had determined his students should replace the apostate ministers in the urban churches as well. That year, he founded a seminary and later a college of liberal arts, but these remain adjunct of the Bible school until the time of his death in 1947. As Trollinger tells us, most of the students at Northwestern came from working and lower middle class families. Few had any formal education beyond high school and many were older people looking for a new start in life. Tuition cost almost nothing, but most students had to work long hours at outside jobs to pay for their board and books. At Northwestern, students learned no Greek or Hebrew. In their two or three year programs, they studied the English Bible, learned Riley's way of interpreting it, and had practical training in evangelism or how to propagate the doctrines that Riley said were forever settled in heaven. Every semester, students had to perform Christian service work. And while the service included mission work in jails, hospitals, logging camps, and Native American reservations, much of their time was spent in the poor rural churches of the region. In these churches, they taught Sunday school classes, spoke at youth meetings, gave musical performances, and even preached on Sundays to congregations without a pastor. Every summer, they fanned out across the region to run vacation Bible schools for children. In time, Northwestern became well known around the upper Midwest, an increasing number of churches grateful for its assistance, looked to the school for pastors. Most of these were Baptists, for Baptist congregations could hire their own ministers. And unlike some other denominations, the Northern Baptist Convention did not have educational qualifications that would prevent Bible school graduates from being ordained. By 1935, 155 Northwestern graduates were serving as pastors or evangelists in the region. And by 1940, the number had reached 224. These Northwestern pastors were willing to work for much lower wages than seminary trained ministers. And because many of the rural churches were too poor to pay a supporting salary, many pastors served two or more congregations. Trained to evangelize, a number built congregations for churches that had shut down or were on the verge of having to close. The result, Trollinger writes, 
was the appearance of explicitly fundamentalist churches or moderate, liberal, or folk evangel evangelical churches had been before. Northwestern trained pastors tended to maintain a close relationship with their alma mater, receiving the same services they themselves had once performed. In return, their congregations sent funds mm -hmm. and students to the Institute. Then, as Northwestern grew, it gained the resources to give the pastors further support, a monthly magazine that provided sermon outlines, biblical exegesis, and practical advice, and an extension service for their churches to create one one administrator called an indoctrinized and a trained and efficient laity. It also helped a summer Bible conference for fellowship and study. And in the 1930s, the conference attracted some 30,000 people a year. Then too, Riley himself maintained personal connection with his graduates. After his defeat in the National Baptist Convention in 1926, he served as a one-man placement office, recommending new graduates to churches that asked for them and sometimes moving an older graduate from one church to the next. Often he made tours of the region to encourage his boys to see that they stayed true to the faith and loyal to their alma mater. In this way, he created a denomination within a denomination. By 1930, Northwestern graduates made up at least 35% of Northern Baptist ministers in Minnesota. The percentage increased in the next two decades, as did their numbers throughout the upper Midwest. National Northern Baptist Convention leaders almost yearly sought to mandate stricter educational requirements for their ministers, such as seminary training or at least the completion of an NBC prescribed reading course. But the depression was not the time to raise educational standards and Riley and other fundamentalist leaders put up a successful resistance. By 1935, Northwestern graduates controlled three out of six local Baptist associations in Minnesota. And at the end of 1936, state convention, they took on the liberal leadership with their own slate of candidates and won. The election made Riley the de facto head of the Minnesota Baptist Convention, and he maintained control of it for the next 10 years. It's very we, brilliant what, sorry, Brother Phil. Uh, I, I was just thinking, I wonder if he, had this planned the whole way of what he was going to do because he really knew how to offer the poor people a way to get some education and a way to get training but it, it was like how william miller wrote um uh if a person can't learn to think for themselves what is that i uh, quote you may as well stamp bigot on their forehead and and send them out right they can't do any good really because they're just um they're not thinking they have a yes and that's what this guy was doing he was great taking them in and he it was like he had a system of how he was going to um have train them so you know that they would replace and take over the churches yeah, and, that, uh, and using the schools the way they did to shape it all to yeah to, to and it it's Catholic. It kind of reminds me of what the Catholic Church did too, because remember even during Martin Luther, um, uh, his time frame, uh, you couldn't read. Nobody could read the Bible. They couldn't read, and the only way that was one reason um, Martin Luther went into uh wanted to be like a 
a priest is because he could learn to read. and They would let him read the Bible because they were keeping the reading from people. They sort of kept control of, um, you know, the education. And so, wow, you know, I wonder if this guy, did, did anyone get the um, inkling that he planned this or he just kind of did this along the way and it just worked out for him? Or? You know, I was kind of thinking about that too, how, how, you know, how we don't know our end from our beginning and we, we don't, we, we have ideas, but we don't understand how it's going to turn out in the end. But so whether or not he planned it or just his um, ideology and the way he wanted to, to groom things, it just worked out to where it controlled a lot of, controlled a lot of, brought control on a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, this also, you know, now that you mention it, uh, is very much like how uh, Bannon, Miller, and um, Sessions got together to overthrow the uh, the nominal uh, Republican Republicans to overtake the Republican Party to be the. Uh, extreme right conservative that they wanted and how they built that up, um, you know, intentional. Nice point. Nice that was a plan. That, that's yeah, so, really yeah. a good point, Brother Fell. So, th so they did plan it and it makes me wonder if this guy planned it or he just kind of learned this along the way. Yeah, well, if he, if he didn't plan it initially because he was because he saw it as being successful, you know, he probably at some point did plan it. Yeah, as as he as he was seeing what it was doing, he yeah put more thought into it. Is that what you mean? As he went along, right. his understanding of what he was doing began to develop. Yeah, he set the stage here, didn't he? Right. I, I think he became. And I said, maybe initially he, he didn't, but as he continued and saw how successful he was, I think he was becoming more intentional on things that he implemented. Yeah, because to control it yeah. as such, it requires a lot of moving parts. Yes. And, and uh, yeah, and you have to understand those moving parts. It, but, but, he, but Phil brings up a good point though with Bannon sessions and yeah, or that they, you know, they they understood those moving parts and how they had to operate those moving parts. Yeah, that was a really good point, Brother Phil. That was the furthest thing from my mind. So I really appreciated you uh, bringing that in. Oh, praise the Lord. Yeah, see, this is why I like these discussions because you know one word or thought brings out another, and it's Amen. just the, the the spirit working amongst us. This is beautiful. Amen. As leader of the state delegation to the NBC, Riley fought running battles with the national leadership. At the same time, he fought to keep his graduates within the convention. At Northwestern, prospective ministers were constantly told that anti-Christian modernism had infected the NBC and understandably, many concluded that they should lead their congregations out of the denomination. NBC officials had foreseen such an exodus. In a 1935 report, one of the many urging See, I think we went too far. One of the, here we go. One of the many urging a change in educational requirements, an NBC committee noted that too many men are coming out of certain institutions who can be anything else as well as Baptist, but they turn to the Baptist ministry because of our democratic form of government offers easy access to the Baptist church. Mm -hmm. In other words, Bible schools like Riley's were installing non-denominational fundamentalists in Baptist churches. Three years later, 
the NBC's Board of Education declared that the situation had reached a point of crisis. In the central and western states, it observed the ministry of our churches is rapidly filling up with the graduates of Bible schools and other short course institutions. As the board saw it, the most serious problem was that Bible school graduates have been trained away from loyalty to our denomination, and they are constantly leading away from our churches that heretofore have been loyal members of our fellowship. Unless this strong tendency be checked, it warned, nothing but disaster faces our denomination. Riley, however, hoped that fundamentalists might one day prevail in the NBC, and it was a measure of his power over his graduates that Over his power, the graduates, okay, graduates that he held most of them within the denomination until he decided to leave it himself. In 1943, the NBC's Foreign Mission Society appointed, appointed an outspoken social activist as its executive secretary. Riley and other fundamentalists objected vehemently and when the society refused to rescind the appointment, they established their own agency, the Conservative Baptist Foreign Mission Society. NBC officials refused to recognize this new body and in retaliation, Riley persuaded the Minnesota State Convention to withhold 50% of its funding to the NBC. The ensuing controversy came to a head at the National Convention in 1946 when Riley and other fundamentalists offered a series of resolutions almost identical to those he and his colleagues had proposed in the early 1920s. Apparently, they had decided the moment had finally come to take over the convention, but as before, all their resolutions were soundly defeated and an amendment making representation of churches in the NBC a function of the percentage of funds they contributed to the convention passed overwhelmingly. Separation now seemed the only course open to them. And shortly after the convention, they, with Riley's support, founded the Conservative Baptist Association. In May 1947, Riley personally tendered his resignation to the NBC. He died in December that year at age 86. And he died, he died in December that year at age 86. And a few months later, the Minnesota Baptist Convention, along with fundamentalist churches in other states followed their leader and quit the denomination for the Conservative Baptist Association. Riley's rebellion was the most serious schism the Northern Baptist Convention endured, but it was hardly the only breakaway of its kind. From the late 1920s through the 1940s, hundreds of fundamentalist congregations cut themselves loose from the major Northern denominations and formed new associations. For instance, the Independent Fundamentalist Fellowship, founded in 1930, by former Congregationalists. Most of these separatist churches and associations were Baptist for exactly the reason NBC officials had pointed to. And some of them like the CBA and the General Association of Regular Baptist, a group formed in 1932 by a rump party of the Old Baptist Bible Union took root in particular regions of the West and Midwest and survived into the 21st century with a thousand or more churches. In one of the most important developments of the period, fundamentalists made inroads into the South and Southwest, 
creating networks of separatist Baptist churches that by the 1970s had moved the fundamentalist center of gravity below the Mason-Dixon line. The man most responsible for bringing fundamentalism to the South was J. Frank Norris, the Fort Worth preacher who had fought the fundamentalist wars of the 1920s with Riley, Shields, and Stratton. Norris is not remembered fondly in Texas. His name is generally associated with disgraceful attacks on fellow ministers, extremist politics, and scandals of the most lurid sorts. His direct theological heirs tend to be Boulderize, not sure what that means, Boulderize of his story. Yeah, what does that mean? To I got it for you. Uh, remove material that is considered improper or offensive from a text or an account, especially with the result that the text becomes weaker or less effective. Oh, you got it. Duh. <laughs> okay, so it so says removing. Tend to boulderize theological errors. So, re to... so, it, so removed his life story <clears throat> because he was offensive. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess that's what it means, huh? Mm. Yeah, Norris managed. Yeah, thank you for looking that up. Uh, yet Norris managed the impressive feat of important militant anti-modernism into a region where there were no modernists. Norris began his career as highly successful Southern Baptist minister. Though brought up by an alcoholic father on a small farm in the hill country of West Texas, he went to Baylor University and from there to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville where he graduated first in, first in his class. He pastored a church in Dallas, then edited the leading Texas Baptist newspaper, and in 1909 took the pulpit of the First Baptist Church in Fort Worth, known as the Church of the Cattle Kings. Respectably, however, let's see. Oops. Okay. There we go. Uh, yeah, I'm using my phone, so whenever a chat comes in, it covers my whole phone. <laughs> okay, so respectability, however, did not suit him. True to his country roots, which he shared with Lyndon Johnson, he had what an acolyte called a barnyard vernacular, a coruscating wit, and a need to dominate every other man in the room. He called making converts hanging hides on a barn door. Not long after taking over First Baptist, he deliberately drove the well-to-do out of his church with sensational sermons and attacks on the Fort Worth establishment. Like Riley, he created a huge adoring congregation of working class people, but he made enemies as well. When in 1912, he accused the mayor of corruption and the city fathers of encouraging vice and iniquity, his church was destroyed by fire and he was indicted and nearly convicted of arson. Fourteen years later, he was indicted again, this time for shooting and killing a friend of the current mayor. He pleaded self-defense. The man had barged into his office after threatening him on the telephone, and he was acquitted of murder. The facts in both cases remain murky. Around 1917, 
Norris began to develop a relationship with such Northern fundamentalists as Riley, Gray, and Dixon. By 1922, he was a pre-millennialist, a biblical in, in, in inerrantist. Okay, I guess that means uh, absolute correction of everything in the Bible. And a proper member of both the BBU and WCFA. Isn't, and North, isn't this the, the same guy that has the son that we see on Facebook? Somebody knows about the son? Is that right? That speaks against his father? I don't know. I don't Say have that Facebook. again. <clears throat> is it, is it this Norris, the one who has a son who speaks against what his father did all those years? Oh. Mm. I'm with Brother Fell. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't have Facebook. <laughs> I'll try to look him up. Okay. Uh, in Texas, Norris called Southerners to a holy war against the infidel modernist doctrines spreading into the South. For lack of shale, for, for lack of a lack of a Shaler Matthews or a Harry Emerson Fosdick to attack, he discovered modernist disguised, let's see, where, where are we? Sorry, I don't know what happened. Let's see. Okay, here, here we are, he discovered. You found it? Mo yeah, um, well, I did. Oh, here it is, okay. He discovered modernist disguised as respectable Southern Baptist Professors at Baylor, he charged, were teaching evolution. The pastor of an influential Texas church had reviewed a modernist book and therefore was a modernist. An Old Testament scholar at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary was teaching the higher biblical criticism, though his students thought he was doing the opposite. These charges did not sit well with the SBC colleagues. In 1922, 33 prominent Texas Baptists signed a statement calling Norris divisive, self-centered, autocratic, hypercritical, and non-cooperative. The following year, the Baptist General Convention of Texas ejected him. Expulsion from the SBC put Norris just where he wanted to be. He solidified his ties with the Northern fundamentalist, exchanging pul pulpits with Reuben Torrey and campaigning with Riley's WCFA against the teaching of evolution in the Texas schools. He conducted revivals across the country and started a Bible school in Fort Worth that later evolved into a seminary. My work has prospered more by my being out. More people have turned in sympathy toward my work than if I were in, he wrote in a colleague sometime later. When not otherwise occupied, Norris battled the forces of evil in politics. In the 1970s, he railed against Texas judges. He deemed lax in enforcing prohibition. He urged Fort Worth citizens to oust all Catholics from the city government. And before, and before the 1928 presidential election, he campaigned tirelessly against Al Smith, the first Catholic to run for president. Thereafter, his politics became less than consistent. At first, he supported the New Deal on the grounds that it would avert revolution. Then he turned against it on the grounds that it was the communist revolution. He never engaged in anti-Semitism, but he praised the Nazi regime for saving Germany from communism until 1938, when remembering his premillennial Zionism he condemned Hitler for persecuting the Jews. He opposed US involvement in Europe until 1940. Then in another about face, he preached revivals to rally support for intervention and praised President Roosevelt. 
<laughs> That's what I was gonna say. Same thing you just said, flip okay. flopper. Is that what is that the words that he just used? Oh, he did it about face. Okay, yeah. Because that's what, it, I mean, it seems like he does one thing, he, the New Deal. He supported the New Deal and then turned because there was a communist revolution seen as communism. And then I, I've heard this before too, where they praised um, Germany for, um, and Hitler for saving them from communism. Yeah, he, he did a lot of about faces. Uh, in a post-war crusade against communism, he rallied, he allied himself with his former enemy, the Catholic hierarchy, mm -hmm. and discovered red fifth columnists in the leadership of the Southern Baptist Convention. I think we looked that up before, right? The fifth columnist. Yeah, the red, yeah, the red fifth columnist. What was it? Can you uh, recap? What, what that is, the Red Fifth Columnists? Yeah, what was that? I'll look it up. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think we found it before. It was called the Fifth Column. The Fifth Column is any group of people who undermine a larger group from within usually in favor of an enemy group or nation. The activities of the fifth column can be overt or clandestine. Forces gathered in secret can mobilize openly to assist an external attack. This term is also extended to organized actions by military personnel. Clandestine fifth column activities can involve acts of sabotage, disinformation or espionage executed within defense lines by secret sympathizers with an external force. I'll post it in the chat. I've heard of fifth column before, but I didn't realize that this red fifth columnists pertained to that definition. And so the red was what they were, was that the communism? Is that That's like what I'm wondering because I put in the search red fifth columnist and and uh, that's what came up as a whole bunch of fifth columnist definitions, not red. You know what I mean? That's why. I'm yeah, thinking, that's. I think the red is is associated. Weren't the communists called? Weren't they called re reds? Weren't they? Or were they? Weren't they? Wasn't that a slang kind of a term for them? Yeah, the red, uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Like the, like the Bolsheviks, I think, were red. Red Army. Red Army, okay, yeah. yeah. So, this just reminds me, let me, I'm just gonna try to read that again. In a post-war, in a post-war crusade against communism, so communism, king of the south, he allied himself with his former enemy, the Catholic hierarchy, the king of the north, and discovered red fifth columnists. So, so within, so that, I mean, it, it, I'm thinking of how Donald Trump and Putin, King of the North and King of the South, uh, came together. Uh, to, so Donald Trump was planted like within to destroy the United States. Am I wrong? I'd have to think it through more. I, 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 I think it's great that you're thinking like that though. Brother Phil, because you probably you see the comparison, the pattern. I was looking up while you were talking. I was looking up to check the red part. I was still stuck in that part, Brother Phil. I was still a little behind because I just wanted to be sure I I had communism and that red mentioned there, right? And a red scare. So I found Red Scare, and that's the promotion of fear about communists. So they were afraid that there were 
infiltrate us inside, like what you're saying, Brother Phil, like somehow they infiltrate from the inside. Is that what you were yeah. saying? Yes. Hmm. I found another article I'm trying to glean through while you guys are talking, but it's, it was interesting when I was looking at the Red Fist column and it was in this article that I just posted a piece of, but it was Joe McCarthy and and then who's right next to him is Roy Cohen on, on the link, on the picture, but. Um, oh but yeah, so the link is there, that's right. I knew that we know this stuff, but it's good to hear these reminders because we can piece it together again, you know? Yeah, it says Trump isn't the first witch hunt hunter, the witch hunter who claims he's the witch rather than the hunter, which he did on Saturday for the 317th time to be exact. The red baiting Senator Joe McCarthy, so there's that red again in here. The red baiting Senator Joe McCarthy, who is literally the dictionary definition of a witch hunter, fine tuned the spin that he was the prey rather than the perpetrator. He was ready with rejoinders before the ink dried on reports, branding him a fraud christening as Operation Whitewash, the first of the congressional condemnation and asserting that it gave a green light to the red fifth column in the United States. So it is a working from within to, I have to go back and reread that definition, but working from within to sabotage and they, they twist and turn things upside down is what I'm kind of getting out of that. Right. And it destabilizes the organization from within. Yeah. I wonder why the, the color red was used. Do you know why they would choose the color red? Was the flag red? You know, of course, yeah. then you think of the Republican Party as being red, right? So I'm like thinking about that color a lot. It's blood red. Yeah, I thought I about know. that too, dear Jackie. That crossed my mind. Yeah. Yeah, like it's funny because when I put in the red, I still come up with only taking us back to fifth column. There's got to be somewhere to find the red fifth column. Unless it did have to do with communism. Yeah. The red does have to do with communism. And then I looked up red, right? When I typed in red, yeah. up came the red scare, right? I think I typed in red and com communism. That's what I typed in. And up came red scare for me, which so now I'm just wondering where did they originally come up with the word red for? If there must be a reason, well, you know? You mean in communism or? Wasn't that just that using that color. It could have been yellow or do you follow what I'm saying? The yeah. red, I'm wondering where that stems from and yeah. how it's threaded all the way through to the Republican party even. Well, we do know that it was, that communism is a threat in this history. So you know, post, post World War II, well, actually prior to that even socialism and uh, communism, they were afraid of, and that's why they were praising Hitler for um, stopping communism. So if that's where they're getting the red from, from, you know, Russia and communism, because red is associated with it, but I don't know if it's where, where, how red. Yeah, that, that crossed my mind too, Sister Elaine, Russia and the red, and they're known as the, I keep wanting to, I keep hearing commie red, like you know what I mean? Like I've heard people say that, yeah. commie, those commie reds, right? Yeah. Um. So maybe it does have to do with the country's flag, or I don't know. It, it was the time of um, communism as a threat, and that's what we're. That's this time period that we're reading where. Um, leading up to where then later the civil rights um, feminism and LGBT becomes the threat. So this is the time period here, this second history where communism is the threat. Mm -hmm. So these are sympathizers 
um, that was part of that definition as well, that there might be those that sympathize with the communists. I think I, if I understood that correctly, there might be insiders that sympathize with them. All the while. Joseph. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. Uh, boy, there's a lot in that paragraph up above. Um, the support for intervention and praise President Roosevelt. This is what uh, this guy was doing. I mean, he was playing both sides. And it says, in a post-war crusade against communism, he allied himself with his former enemy, the Catholic hierarchy. And that's when this red fifth columnist was discovered in the leadership of the Southern Baptist Convention. So it's anybody within that's sympathetic to communism and he is allied with the Catholic Church, which was his enemy. And they find this. So, so yeah, because he's not, he is not really friends with the Catholic hierarchy. He wants something out of it. So that's how I'm looking at it. Because so, the enemy, that, Catholic hierarchy was his enemy, his former right. enemy. Now it's through this red fifth columnist in the leadership of the Southern Baptist Convention. He's already aligning himself with the Catholic hierarchy. Again, the purposes of, yeah, he has an agenda here for this. Well, because the threat is communism. And yeah. And you have the Catholic Church, remember, supported Hitler as well to keep exactly. communism out. So, right. so, um, so they discover this communist sympathizer in the leadership of the Southern Baptist Church to try to seek and sabotage. And yeah, so that's, that's what. The that's what I'm interpreting it. So the threat united, it's Roosevelt, right? You mentioned and praised Roosevelt in the post war crusade against. Yeah, Hitler. even though he was supporting Roosevelt, this Norris, isn't that his name, Norris? The man yeah. we're talking about, we've been. We already talked about of... Norris, but um, just to back up because it. Um, so we have to go up. Yeah. I'm with you, Miss Jackie. There's a lot here to unpack. Yeah. It, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's giving it information, North. but you have to really think about it. So it's Norris. What was first, the agenda here? So it's Norris that first supported the New Deal. Um, hold on. Yeah. Uh, Expulsion from put Norris just where he wanted to be. He solidified his ties with the Northern fundamentalists. So he's expelled from the Southern Baptist Convention. And he solidified his ties with the Northern fundamentalists, exchanging pulpits with Rubentory and campaigning for with Wiley's, I don't remember what the WCFA was, against the teaching of evolution in Texas schools. So he's teaching, he's campaigning against evolution. He conducted revivals across the country. Started a Bible. He's like a zealot, kind of. Yeah. Later. Going after anything, you know. That's... Well, it's in, yeah, that's going to uh, disrupt his agenda. Mm -hmm. So, when not otherwise occupied, Norris battled the forces of evil in politics. In the 1970s, he railed against Texas judges. He deemed lax in enforcing prohibition. He urged Fort Worth citizens to oust all Catholics from the city. 
um, from the city government. And before the 1928 presidential election, he campaigned tirelessly against Al Smith, the first Catholic. So he's, you know, showing, we're seeing that he's against Catholics, the first Catholic here to run for president. Thereafter, his politics became less than consistent. At first, he supported the New Deal on the grounds that it would avert, avert revolution. Then he turned against it on the grounds that it was the communist revolution. So he's saying that the New Deal is the communist revolution. So there you see that the threat. Socialism. Mm -hmm. they, they, communism. Just like they, they thought that was socialism or communism. Same yeah. way they feared today is socialism. Right. Yeah. He never engaged in anti-Semitism but he praised the Nazi regime for saving Germany from communism until 1938 when remembering his pre-millennial Zionism, he condemned Hitler for persecuting the Jews. He opposed US involvement in Europe until 1940. Then in another about faith, he preached revivals to rally support for intervention and praised President Roosevelt in a post-war crusade against communism, he allied himself with his former enemy, the Catholic hierarchy, and discovered red fifth columnists in the leadership of the Southern Baptist Convention. So he was a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. He's expelled from it. And he's being more effective, he says, he's more effective outside the Southern Baptist Convention than, than what he was within. Yeah, he just uses whoever works yeah. for him at the time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Very trying to see what the agenda is, though, where he's headed with all of this. All the while, in this next sentence, his celebrity grew and his empire expanded. It was all about himself. Sounds like Trump. Yeah, I think that's what Elaine was yeah referring to too part of his charm so so i have a question mm -hmm. the i i don't know the word for this but in our studies we say one plus two equals three what what is that what is the word for that is that pair is that is that under parable uh, the triple application? Yeah, yeah, the triple application. Okay. Um, I can't remember exactly what they came under, but I think triple, triple application is, is, is good enough. So one plus two equals three. So here uh, we read, you know, we just read about, uh, where'd it go? The fifth, the red fifth columnist. Okay, and I, and I brought up the king of the north, king of the south, uh, even though they're enemies, you know, uh, like Antigonus and Pyrrhus, even though they're enemies, you know, they come together. So here we read again, you know, two enemies coming together uh, to disrupt, destabilize internally. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what this brought to my, to my mind is I have no idea where we read this because we read so many documents. Uh, but if I say it, perhaps one of you will remember it. But either it's either from A.T. Jones document or from um, how Constitution uh, became Christian. Christian or the Presbyterian. It might be in, in the Presbyterian um documents that we were reading a few weeks ago but i remember in that conversation also two enemies came together um the protestants i, I say it might be with the at jones but the protestants were looking for help from the catholics that's right and and in that discussion you know, in that discussion, we were talking about how the daughters were looking to their mothers to unite, even though they hated each other. 
in order to accomplish a goal. Do, do you remember that conversation? Yes. Yes, I do. Boy. Yeah. Yes. So, so yeah. here we are. We're seeing here, you know, we're seeing many examples of this. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Brother Fell. Very yeah. excellent. What you're Connecting pointing out. Keep dots. going. Keep going. Yeah. So, you know, this is not a coincidence. No. Um, no. So we're seeing, uh, you know, these triple applications how, you know, uh, coming up in many different places where two enemies are coming together to destabilize an organization from, from in, you know, internally. So perhaps it would be prudent for us to be looking at, or at least expecting uh, right now at, at this moment, you know, even though we know that the evangelicals and the Catholics are not friends, you know, we suspect that they are going to have to come together in order to um, destabilize, um, you know, the United States or, um, you know, I, I don't know what the word is, but they are going to come together. And it'd it probably be wise for us to just, you know, keep our eyes open to see, you know, what leader from the evangelicals are going to reach across, you know, to papacy um, for, 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 for a common reason to destroy would it, you know, would within. It be, would it be the... Um, and I don't know, I'm think, trying to think this out loud with you guys. The, would it be the evangelicals or would it be just the king of the north in general? Well, I... I because I, the reason I ask that is because the, the, the counterfeit is the counterfeit to equality, right? Yeah. I do remember the document you were, I, I don't remember which title it was, but I remember what you're talking about when we saw them join. And it was where they said that the, the Catholics were just, I think it's the same one you're talking about, where the Catholics were just waiting. They didn't have to do anything. They were just waiting. They yes. knew that the United States needed them to, right. to, to do what they needed to do. And, mm -hmm. and right. we did reach a cross and and take their help, that that would be the undoing of the United States. Mm -hmm. Right, right. They'll that, do that, the that, dirty that, work, the daughters. The daughters yeah. will do the dirty work. So where we're right. headed is this evangelical destruction. It, it makes me think of uh, Liz Cheney again and what Liz Cheney said when they ousted her about how it's the undoing of the Republican Party and possibly the United States. I, I, I might be poorly paraphrasing what she said. So what they're doing is what's going to destroy. Here they're doing the same thing they've done in the past history, thinking that what they're doing is right and, and um, biblical and right is actually wrong and they're going to bring about their own destruction. And they're going to bring about the destruction of the institution of the United States. So I don't know with, with how you're saying what you're saying. I, I don't, I mean, I'm saying I do not know. But what I do know is that the papacy is the counterfeit of equality. So does, so who joins with them? Does this all force the, the, the liberal side to join hands with, or is it the evangelicals that join hands with the papacy? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Right. Mm -hmm. um, from, from, from all the readings from the evangelicals, from the, you know, A.T. Jones, from all these documents that we've been reading, it's always been the evangelicals reaching yeah. out to Catholicism, to the papacy. So I, I don't know, you know, when, when the church and state comes together, which, you know, which is happening, but the, it's the evangelicals, it's not the papacy that the United States is supporting as the, as, as, as the arms. So it's, it's the United States not giving arms to the papacy. The United States is giving arms to the evangelicals. Um, 
so so I, you know everything that we've been reading so far it's the evangelicals that it's reaching across so it seems like whatever you know whatever uh, laws you know, equality laws or inequality laws that the evangelicals are going to force the United States government to, to put out there, mm -hmm. they're going to have to reach over to the Catholics, to, to the papacy, to, to solidify it. So it, it seems like from the evangelicals to, to yeah, the papacy. Yeah, you're right. It would have, I would think it would have to be as well because you brought up another point that it's like hard to juggle all this stuff in my head all at once, but the union of church and state, and it's the evangelicals that are, that are doing that work. Right. And the, and, and the papacy is just waiting for evangelicals with the United States as, as their arm to reach across to the papacy for their help. And then now you got the evangelicals, the United States, the most powerful country in the world, plus, you know, the papacy, the most, uh, I think there's, uh, other than Islam, I guess, the most um, uh, Christian uh, population, uh, Catholics, the, the biggest. Um, so whatever law that United States has to pass, they're just gonna get more help from the Catholics. That, that's what so, it seems to me is saying in, in these documents that we're reading. Will it be the Republican Party or through Biden, though, yeah. too, because he's Catholic? And I was I was thinking about an article that I read today, um, how they've been wanting to get a committee to it to examine the the um, uh, January 6th. Yes when they scaled the walls and all that and the right that's the date yeah yeah it was january 6th you're right yes um and they shot it down the republicans shot it down they won't allow a committee to investigate all that so the democrats are like really struggling so i was thinking while you're talking this out i know what you're saying is right but then I'm like trying to also figure out how are the Democrats going to try to uh, overcome all this? Will they link? You know, well, according to El, according <laughs> to El, uh, according to Elder Tess, Biden is not the president of the Sunday Law. Uh, she has mentioned that in uh, her previous studies that Biden is not the president of the Sunday law. Now, he might have to compromise and to enact something for the next president to, you know, to enact the Sunday law. But according to Elder Tess, Biden is not the president of the Sunday law. So who, it's whoever comes next. Like we were talking Trump trying to get back in again or or somebody of that caliber right now uh, he says and whether you can believe this or not how it'll all play out that he is going to run for president in 24 mm -hmm. and he's got a good portion of the republicans that will support him they in but, fact they don't they so feel that they don't have any agenda unless Trump is there leading them. It is the threat here in this, what we're reading. It is the threat that brings the two king of the north together, the mother, the mother and the daughter together. It's the threat. And I don't remember um, in the document the specific thing that they united over. I don't know if you can but it is in this what we're reading here it's the threat so we take that and we could know that the threat today is um you know the three threats that the issue is gender now but those three that threats were nationalism sexism and homophobia the, the gender issue so so it'll be over the threat that they unite Yes. 
So yeah, and so the these States, are. And the United States will take the help of the Catholic Church to, um, to, how do I say? They need they need the Catholic Church for they'll, they'll unite for this common cause, but their purpose is to win the whole the whole prize. But what the Catholics said in that other document that we read is that they're just waiting for the United States to do that because they know that the United States needs them, and that that will be so. Uniting over this threat is going to bring us bring the United States to ruin. But I remember now, granted, I've missed a lot, right? And I'm doing my best to fill in the gaps. And so I'm still remembering when um, Elder Tess was showing that Michael Moore and AOC were going to actually lead the wrong way too, because she was warning that um, many of us when we were just embracing the, these liberal idea, ideas that, mm -hmm. right, um, many people in the movement were watching too much liberal ideas, right? And right. she was trying to um, warn them that those people that they were watching are going to be the people that lead towards that Sunday movement or pan help me because I'm, I've missed many presentations in the last two years. So I've got that piece in my mind. Can you help connect that? Maybe Sister Elaine or somebody, Brother Phil? Do you know what I'm referring to? Yes. Oh, you're talking about how AOC and Michael Moore are not the one to follow. They're gonna lead, the, they're gonna lead people in the wrong direction as well. Yes, but I was thinking yeah, Michael Moore's a Catholic. So I'm still wondering how that's going to play out in in this scenario. That's so, why that's why I was kind of so, go ahead, Phil. Okay. So the way I remember that presentation, and, and you are right, Sister Susan, you are right about Michael Moore and and uh, AOC. And but so connecting two things, first of all, uh, Biden will not be the president that brings in the Sunday law. So we know that. And as far as Michael Moore and AOC, what she was saying is they have, yes, they are liberal, but they have nothing to offer us. And I think the point that Elder Tess was bringing out in that presentation is many of us as priests were looking to them for answers rather yes. than rather than you know within the movement rather than you know towards toward mm -hmm. you know god and, and and line upon line and what the line upon line is showing us rather than looking at that and what elder tess and parminder was teaching we a priest were looking towards their liberalism thinking that we that they have something to offer us right i wrong. remember that part right and so right. how does but i also felt like in my mind they were also going to merge with this uh three you know yeah, yeah that's where we fold union somehow yeah that's where i'm struggling too because they would be uniting with the counterfeit yeah, that's why I made that statement when I did that um, presentation on Iceland. Don't look for Fahrenheit's, Michael Moore's social utopia. What they're looking for, it's not going to really happen. No, it'll be a counterfeit. But but what we're trying to figure out here is, the, or just think through, is the, is the evangelicals that unite but yet the counterfeit is liberal, is a false, is a counterfeit liberal movement. And we know that the Democrat side is the liberal side and AOC and, and, and all of them. So they're gonna lead to the wrong direction, but who unites? Is it the evangelicals or is it, is it just broadly the king of the North?
Yeah, that's, yeah, th these are, these are excellent questions and uh, things that we have to really look into and be aware of uh, what's happening in the world. Because every, every, every document that we read thus far seems to indicate that it is the evangelicals who are crossing yeah. over, not the liberals. So I don't know, I don't know how the liberals are going to, um, you know, maybe they'll just uh, come into the fold because of um, when uh, uh, Fra uh, Pope Francis, you know, when he joins with, with the daughters, maybe the liberals will join with them. I don't know. You know what? Uh, but it, but it just seems like that, you know, all the documents that we've been reading, it's the evangelicals that's reaching over. Yeah, uh, and I, have, I have the notes for the um, that last Guadalupe presentation too. Um, and the point that she's bringing out there is the counterfeit um, when it comes to gender. And she reads and goes through several statements and documents um, about how Francis looks like a liberal um, or for equality, equality, for equality, and then equality, not liberal, but he, but he looks like equality, but he's a counterfeit. He's worthless. It's worthless equality. And she brings out several statements by him. So when, though he may be about show on the surface, the beautiful words that he says, he's a counterfeit and his equality is worthless. And so, and he is against um, women in high positions. <clears throat> so you have the evangelicals that are against women in high positions, but that but the Democrats are not necessarily against women in high positions, right? So you have so maybe that's where we're looking at this that need to think it through with um, Pope Francis and who he is because. He's the counterfeit equality and the statements that she brings out. And we're going to do that on Wednesday, I think, June 5th, if that's when, June 5th, whenever that is, um, we'll go through those notes. And if anybody watches her presentation again, but she brings out how some of the beautiful things he says, but then you got to go back and understand what he means by what he says. But she makes the point about you know, he is a counterfeit and he's definitely a sexist. Right. And what and what um, you know, he, he is his views are worthless. I remember her, I remember she saying that. Yeah. And, and it it's because it's just a counterfeit. Because um, what he what he does and what he says are two different things. Yeah. So it's in that fake. aspect, I can see the evangelicals in the Republican Party linking up with him because they're against the whole gender issue and homosexuality. Yeah, the transgender, they're really big on that too. And since Pope Francis just came out about that, they have that in common now. Right. Abortion so, so too. So, That's right, abortion too. Take this with what we're reading here and what we read before, that it's um, a common threat that they unite over. So the common threat, we know that the issue um, that is, the, the Sunday law issue is revolved around is in this union of church and state is over the issue of gender. Gender is the threat, so they unite based on that threat well okay. you know the polls oh sorry go ahead sorry uh when you paused i thought you were done um the polls are showing that a majority of the people are not for um the supreme court to vote against roe versus wade so what i'm trying to say is that there is a large majority of people that are against this conservative play that's happening and they will 
rise up. One of the things and that, that would be a threat. That would be a threat if a lot of people rise up against, you know, um, <laughs> these the, oppressive law that's trying to be enacted. The document that Fell is remembering, and I'm remembering bits and pieces of it more and more. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought with what you were saying. I hate when that happens. It happens <laughs> to me all the time these days. Um, because we're definitely, let's see, because back in the document that we read, whichever one it was, I, could, I might be able to find it later. Um, the Catholics, I'm trying to remember what their issue was there, but, but we know that the Catholics said that we'll just wait because, oh, I know it had to do with voting. It had to do with voting. If you remember that bell, it had to do with voting. That that they would need the Catholic vote. Do you remember that? Right. Yes. So so with what Susan just said, trip that up in my mind again. That um, they're going to come to a place where they need the Catholic vote. Ah. I, yes. To counter to because counter this enough. overwhelming wave of um, right. people they don't coming have enough to to win this. Yes, that's right. That's right. Party. Yes, they don't because there's a majority. I've I've looked at the polls. I've read some different articles, and the people, for the most part, are not for this being overturned. So they'll unite and engage the Catholics, or respect maybe speculating. I don't know, but the, we're trying to take it through. Unite and engage the Catholic vote in order to have a majority. And win. And they'll win, but their win is the destruction and demise of the United States, the institution. And the Adventist church goes down with it. So, yeah, no, yep, um, yep, yep. And you can see how that once they've got their, their thumb screw tightened on that one issue, they're just going to go for it on the other ones too. Uh, just a question. Yeah, I mean, the Supreme Court is the one that has the majority if there's, you know, the ruling on abortion. Yes. Yeah, with. But the general public isn't for that ruling to go down, is what I'm trying to say, if I haven't been clear. The general right. public out, in the, out there in America which would they're be, not would, for it which would be why they would need to go after the Catholics. yes yes yep because the catholics will stand by their anti-abortion and the anti-transgender right well really good discussion Thanks, Bill, yeah, for bringing that yes, up. Yes, these, these are great discussions. Thank you, everybody. We can't do it without each other. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's see. Shall we continue reading? Let's see. All right, so all the while his celebrity grew and his empire expanded. A part of his charm, it seems, was that he was always raising Cain and no one knew what he might do next. In 1935, he took on a second church, Temple Baptist in Detroit, and detaching it from the Northern Baptist Convention, it created a huge congregation of mm -hmm. rural white Southerners who had come to work in the auto factories. In Detroit and Fort Worth, he broadcast his sermons on the radio and by 1946, his two churches had a combined membership of 25,000, the largest congregation he boasted under the leadership of a single pastor. In addition, he created satellite churches by gathering converts 
from his revivals and sending them his Bible school graduates as pastors. By the time the war broke out, he had led these newly formed churches and a number of others into an organization called the Pre-Millennial Baptist Missionary Fellowship, later the World Baptist Fellowship. In the 1940s, Norris consorted with many powerful people, among them Detroit automobile executives and leading Texas politicians, such as Tom Connolly and Sam Rayburn. The Texas state legislature invited him to speak on several occasions and once honored him for his work in rooting out communists. Just before the war, he traveled to England with the blessings of Roosevelt administration officials and met with Winston Churchill. Later, he gained an audience with Pope Pius XII. Political power clearly appealed to him for during the 1948 campaign, he corresponded with both Harry Truman and Thomas Dewey, assuring both of them that they would win. Could, could, could we go to the... A previous paragraph. I'm slow, guys. Right there. So that part about raising Cain, you know, I've heard that so many times in my life where people say that, use that phrase, but it never jumped out at me until I saw it in print like this with Cain being capitalized. Because I think I was always, when I was hearing someone use that phraseology and when they talk, I thought they, I would picture a cane, you know, a real cane being lifted up in the air, causing a disturbance, you know, somebody yes. raising a cane. And when I saw this in print, it dawned on me because cane was the rebel, really rebellious one, right? The, right. the one that shed the blood and um, the deeper significance of what that's saying there was driven home to me. I never thought about it like I did tonight. The rebellious one. Yeah, the one that murders. Good point. Mm -hmm. Yes, good point, very nice. Okay. Yeah, and... Papacy. Excuse me? I think it's the American papacy. Amer oh, American papacy? Yeah. Okay. I think. Maybe we can revisit that one night. I'm looking at the titles of them and that's, I think, yeah, sold into the hands of Rome. Yeah, that's Jones's writing. But that was, but it was where they, I think it was in this document where they needed they said that they needed the catholic vote and they knew the time would come where they would need the catholic vote and they were just i recall that i was sitting in on that class but i can't tell you either so i've kept quiet but you're right they did it was something like that i just don't remember what we were reading like Brother Fell said, we've been reading so many things that kind of merge together sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But I, you know, but the good thing about all this is I think it's telling the same story. Yes. And that's what we're supposed to be able to be recognizing is that we're seeing the same story over and over again. Yes. Oh yeah, okay. here it is. Such is the attitude of the Catholic Church at present. And as the national reformers find themselves more in need of help, that's who these guys are. The evangelicals are this far right is. They're the national reformers, the covenanters, the, the reformed Presbyterian church who pointed they're all, that they're all the same. And that's who they are still today. The evangelicals, the, the um, far right. Um, such is the attitude of the Catholic church at present. And as the national reformers find themselves more in need of help, and when by repeated advances and in spite of repeated rebuffs, they have come to her and made the proper surrender, she will let her power and influence be felt. Let the reformers do the work as they are doing and bring the matter to the point of being voted upon 
and then there will be found at the polls every Catholic voter. It's it's the United States whom the political priest can rule, casting his ballot for the religious amendment, which in the words of the Pope will cause the constitution of the United States and legislation to be modeled on the principles of the true church. And by which as the Archbishop of St. Louis says, heresy and unbelief will become crimes and will be punished as crimes as in the Christian countries of Italy and Spain. It's Sister, the, what page are you reading from? Um, five, page five. What document are you in? The American Papacy. Oh. I'm looking, I'm scanning. I opened it, but I still haven't found which. Do you want me to pull it up real quick? Oh, that would be good. So we could all look at the words. I think that's, at least I know it helps me better. It does me too. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Um, Can you make it bigger? Yeah, I'm just thinking about where it is because this is where I just read, but we might want to back up the teeny bit. It is, it is true, as Mr. Scoble says, the national reformers now receive somewhat cool treatment and perhaps sense rebuffs. The Catholic Church does not, to any considerable extent, directly aid the national reform movement She's too crafty for that. She knows as well as they that it is one of the necessities of the situation. And that was something that was pointed out. It was a quote that he's referencing again, um, when there would be the necessities of the situation. And she is determined to have the surrender come from them. So the yep. Catholic Church wants the surrender to come from the United States. It's out of the necessities of the situation that the United States will seek the help of the Catholics. We personally, and we know that it's a counterfeit equality message and that the Pope is sexist and against, um, uh, and is um, homophobic as well. Um, but on the surface, he looks like a, like he's for it. And people are seeing, if you're reading, reading behind the scenes what he means, you'll see it. So, and she is determined to have surrender come from them. So the Catholic Church wants to surrender from the United States. We personally know a gentleman who, riding in the railroad not long since, fell into a conversation with a Catholic priest and finally said to him, what is your church going to do with the religious amendment movement? Are you going to help it forward? Are you going to vote for it? Yep. Oh, said the priest, we have nothing to do with that. We leave the Protestants. We let them do all that. Yeah. They're coming to us. And we only have to wait. So it has to be a necessity um, of the situation, whereas the far right is not the minority. I mean, the majority, they're the minority. And they are going to want the help of the Catholics. So they are coming to us, and we only have to wait. And when in December 1855, the demand for a national Sunday law reached the point at which it was supported by six millions of petitioners, Cardinal Gibbons came out with a letter to Dr. Wilbur F. Crafts, the leader of the Protestant side, heartily endorsing the National Sunday Bill and gladly adding his name to the number of petitioners. And on the strength of the Cardinal's letter, Dr. Crafts and the WC, that was the Women's Christian Temperance Union, added 7,200,000 7, Catholics to the 6 million names already obtained. Such is the attitude of the Catholic Church at present. And as the national reformers find themselves more in need of help, and when they repeated advance, and when by repeated advances and in spite of repeated rebuffs, they have come to her and made the proper surrender, she will let her power and influence be felt. Let the reformers do the work as they are doing and bring the matter to the point of being voted upon, then there will be found at the polls every Catholic voter. It's the United States whom the political priest can rule, casting his ballot for the religious amendment, which in the words of the Pope will cause the constitution of the United States and legislation to be modeled on the principles of the true church, the Catholic church, that's them speaking. And by which, as the Archbishop of St. Louis says, heresy and unbelief will become crimes and will be punished as crimes, as in the Christian countries of Italy and Spain. So 
So I don't know if we, we don't have time to read through the rest of this again, but I put it in the chat. So if anybody wants to read it again. Thank yes, you. I, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's becoming more and more clear. I think things are coming together as we discuss and put our and share our thoughts out there as we put all these other documents that we read, uh, how we can see prophecy being fulfilled and how we're not blind uh, to what is going on in the world. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So really helpful study to read through these books, isn't it? <laughs> yes, thank you. To see them, uh, I didn't mean it for me. I mean, just the Lord leads me. But, but I mean, it's really helpful to read these books and come to um, see the repetition of things. But it's hard. I struggle, like I said a little while ago, I struggle to, to myself to keep it all juggling. What she emphasizes in the Guadalupe camp, um, camp meeting is being able to keep the three lines, the three structures in your mind all at the same time. And when you do that, you'll receive the blessing. And so I thank you, Phil, because I was kind of forgetting some of those points about where the Pope is headed and who he really is and, and how it can't be the, the Democrats that join with him. It's, it is, you're right, it is the evangelicals. They're in the minority and they're gonna need to secure um, the Catholic vote to do what they're gonna do. Yes. Because the Catholics are definitely anti-abortion and homophobic. Wow. Yes, definitely. Well, well, thank you very much. This is, has been a wonderful uh, discussion. The Sabbath is almost here. It's almost eight o'clock. So shall we close here? Are you going to pray, Brother Phil? Yeah. Please pray. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Our wonderful, kind, loving Father in heaven, Lord, we come this evening giving you praise for you indeed are worthy. Lord, it's, uh, it's just, you, you just never cease to amaze me how you take a group of people, we're just people, and truly uh, until this movement um i and i don't know who else feels like this way but i've never felt as oh i don't know if important is the word but i'll just use that word i've never felt important in in this part of your kingdom um, because I, I really never thought and then and I really felt that I, I really had any work to do. Um, all, all this while, Lord, I, I, I just thought that, you know, some, somewhere along the line of my Christian walk that, you know, if I was good enough, whatever that looked like, that, you know, you would just perform this miracle and and save me um you know I, and, and i really didn't think i had any really real significant part to this but as i'm learning more about nature of man nature of us as human beings and how we are we are designed to be your counterpart and 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 now how we come together as discussing and your and really you know, as we're discussing, you know, we, we've, we've always heard that when we study things, when we study your word, you know, you'll bring back to remembrance things that we have forgotten. And tonight's discussion really shows that concept 
uh, when we read one thing and someone says something else and how we just fit together as, as keys in a lock. And we just start discussing and, and, and now we're remembering all these things that we've read before and how it, it's all coming together. And it's like, wow, this is brilliant. And, and how you're using us as indeed your counterpart. It's just, it's, it's exciting. And we're just awed. I'm awed. I'm humbled on how you can use these you know, use as human beings, uh, we, you know, we, we, you know, I thought of us and myself as really nothing and, and to come to think that you're really using us and you're bringing back to remembrance, the things that we have learned before and how exciting this is and how we're lifting your name and how we're working together, we're equal. You know, I'm almost afraid to say that word that, you know, you're equal with us. We're equal with you in some fashion that I just don't understand. But it's, you know, all I can say is praise you, Lord, and just thank you. And you're amazing. And so, wow, this is exciting, Lord. I'm, um, we're, I, I'm in it for the ride. And, you know, I just pray that we'll all go along for the ride, no matter how rocky it is, no matter how hard it might be, you know, the left turns, right turns, that will look higher and we'll stay the course because you are our God and there's nothing in this world, Lord, that should keep us apart from you. And uh, this is, you know, I've, I've not felt this way in a long time, how, how, how excited I am to see you really work in, in my life, in our lives. So, so thank you, Lord. And uh, we thank you for this uh, Sabbath. Um, you know, Sabbath is where we, you know, I, I don't know how the Sabbath is going to be, you know, in, in your kingdom in the future. I don't know what, I don't know what that looks like. But it's just exciting, Lord, that we come together now and in the preparation for the Sabbath. And I just imagine us as we're doing now that we come together and we're learning more about you and every time we come together on the sabbath we just learn and we're continually learning um more and more of your love your grace your mercy your kindness and whatever lessons that you have to teach us we're just coming together to sit at your feet and to say you know at, at the end of the day we're just going out going going back home with this sense of honest so so i know i'm just babbling on lord but i just praise you and thank you and uh we just pray lord that you'll continue to protect us you continue to watch over each and every one of us and i just pray that this excitement that i have will continue on uh throughout the rest of the week and uh may you um may we all sleep soundly and rest soundly um, until we meet again tomorrow, may the Lord watch over each and every one of us. In Yeshua's wonderful name we pray. Amen. 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 All that thrills our soul is 